back to another episode of Fast Fishing for Noobs. I'm one of your co-hosts, Susie Q. We miss you, Sean. Can't wait to have you back. He's, uh, you know, you guys had not heard. Um, Sean lost his mom a couple weeks ago, so if you can, keep him in your thoughts and prayers. Definitely not an easy process to go through. So, I don't really have like a whole lot of new stuff for you. However, the guest that I do have for you today is definitely not a stranger. And he's not a stranger to the podcast at all. I mean, he, he's he's kind of the boss man, like we like to call him. <laughs> and I can see him giggling down in here in the, uh, in the green room or whatever you want to call it. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Brian Schiller. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. I like that. I like that. But uh, yeah, man, uh, Sean, I'm sure you're listening. Keep your head up, buddy. Hopefully it gets easier. But uh, yeah, definitely been thinking about him a lot lately. Yes. Definitely. Well, Brian, I wanted to bring you on to our show today because I know you've had a crazy couple of weeks getting prepped and ready for I can. 2023. Oh, yeah. yeah, it's been a roller coaster for sure. Uh, but uh, it was a successful show. It was exciting. It was exciting for sure. Awesome. I think you kind of freezed up a little bit there. You're kind of frozen on my screen right now. But, oh, no. Uh oh. Am I back? Uh, I can hear you, but you're you're kind of pixelated. frozen in time. That's oh, fine. Oh, now you're kind of back. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the Sean episode all over again. Like he thought he had his laptop charged, and then all of a sudden, like halfway through the episode, like it died on him. So he just like froze. Oh and, no! Uh, gosh, it was me and um, oh uh, Shane Lamont. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I got. <laughs> I actually got to hang out with Shane a little bit at uh, ICAST. It was good to see him again. And uh, I know that was, I think that was his first ICAST. And he had called me when he found out he was going. He was super stoked. And uh, he had another place go as well. Are you there? Oh, there we go. Oh, man. <laughs> kind of froze up there again. Hopefully we get through this. <laughs> I, know. I know there's a <laughs> there's a storm coming and yeah, my internet's been shoddy again lately, so it happens. Yeah. Like I tell my coworkers, I'm like, I oh, just set it on fire, that'll solve all your problems. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me, I'd like to do that. I would like to do that for sure. Uh, but anywho, for uh, the folks who are listening and may not know a whole lot about ICAST, um, you know, kind of what it involves and uh, entails, kind of gives a little bit of a rundown, just like, you know, being the, pr the process of like, not only A, being a vendor there, but also like, you know, if somebody's going there, because I mean, I know it's only like a, like a vendor only type thing, right? You can't get in unless you're uh there by invite or vendor or something like that so yeah it's uh it's an industry show uh icast is kind of um where most companies release products for the following season so obviously you know it takes place in july um every year so july 23 all the new products for 2024 are pretty much being released there at the show um some of them you know maybe you know full-on release there but uh it's a it's an opportunity for you know manufacturers to go and display their products and then distributors um shops wholesale accounts media things like that can come view the products um do write-ups and things like that um on the products for the upcoming months and so on and so forth like you know, I was uh, I got interviewed by Kayak Angler Magazine for uh, some of our new products that just got released on uh, on their webpage. So that was pretty cool. But um, 
Yeah, it's overall, it's just an industry show. It's not open to the public necessarily. Um, like some of our paddle and fin guys got to come down um, in, you know, that's through uh, media, right? Because we're a media outlet for part of the fishing industry, uh, mainly kayak fishing, obviously. But, um, you know, it's, uh, it's just a, a good opportunity to, you know, uh, open new accounts, uh, write orders for the upcoming year and things like that, um, you know, through through some of these shops and dealers and things like that, uh, distributors, so on and so forth. So, um, you know, that's ICAST overall as a whole. Um, you know, if you got like a sponsorship or something, a lot of those companies will go, you know, to ICAST and, uh, you know, Sometimes you can hit them up. They're always looking for extra help. So that's a good way to get in if uh, if you're working with a company or something like that. That was how I got to go to my first ICAST. I think it was three years ago, four years ago, something like that, um, through New Canoe. Um, so I got to go stand in the New Canoe booth, talk to potential dealers, existing dealers, uh, folks in the media, um, did some podcasts down there for him and Paddle and Finn. And, uh, yeah, that first iCast experience is always crazy because, you know, you're seeing everybody, you know, the who's who of the fishing world, right? Like this year, I remember I was standing outside, um, and, uh, I was waiting for the show to get started before I went in and, uh, Bill Dance, Hank Parker, and gosh, why do I always forget the third guy's name? Uh, another big, like old school bass fisherman. They all three get out of an Uber together and walk into the show. You know what I mean? So it's like, you know, the guys you watched growing up as a kid, you know, are there because they're, you know, um, helping out their uh, companies that they work with and things like that. So, you know, you'll you'll see all those guys, some of the big bass pros, MLF, BASS. Um, a lot of kayak guys walking around there as well. Um, so it's, it's kind of cool. YouTubers, you know, like Saul Alex, Fulgaria down there. Um, everybody knows him. And uh, obviously Saul Shane, Greg Blanchard. Um, geez, I'm trying to think of who else. I know Jacob Wheeler was there. Iconelli I saw. You know, so it's, it's everybody, right? Um, the whole fishing industry as a whole kind of collides all together at uh, ICAST. And, um, and it's not only like the freshwater stuff, it's saltwater too. So it's, um, you got a lot of people that come in um, internationally as well. People from Australia, China, uh, Europe, Africa, things like that coming in too, to look at product to potentially carry in their shops and stuff in other countries. So it's, it's kind of cool. It was, it was good to see the international traffic up this year because in uh, years, the past couple of years with COVID and stuff, mm -hmm. the international folks weren't uh, traveling over to the show as much, but it seemed to be business as usual. And uh, the show was a lot bigger than last year as well. So it was, it was very cool. Very cool. Awesome. <clears throat> Um, so, you know, I definitely saw, you know, from your Facebook feeds, uh, you know, some other people that I'm following and whatnot, people who are down there checking out, um, you know, the new products, the new baits, stuff like that. Um, but you know, it's not always necessarily just about that too. Um, I also hear like, it's also great networking opportunity oh, yeah. as well, if you know, how to do it <laughs> yeah for sure i mean the the biggest thing is is you know you start having conversations with people oh, who are you here with or you know you're wearing a shirt that's all you know tagged up in company and you know you start talking about a product and then you're like oh who are you here with you know it's it's one of those things or you go over and you uh you know you're looking at some products in a booth and you start talking to you know, whether it be a sales rep, a marketing director, the owner of the company, whoever it may be. Right. Um, so, yeah, it's it's definitely a good way to uh, make new relationships and not only that, but catch up on existing ones, too. You know, it's um, 
you know, there's some people I only see them once a year and that's at ICAST. Right. So, um, it's kind of cool, you know, once, uh, the work day gets over, you can always meet up for a dinner or a drink or something like that, um, locally and, you know, catch up with those folks. Cause you may live on like opposite ends of the world. Right. Um, you know, like Shane Lamont, for instance, you know, just seeing him, he's in California and, and getting to run into my man there, you know, is, is always good. And, uh, good time catching up with, you know, folks like that, you know, and, uh, you know, or like, for instance, like this year, um, like, you know, the company I work for now had a lot of consumers that are, you know, guides or captains or whatever, come by the booth and, you know, get to talk to them and, and meet your actual customer base too, uh, face to face and have a conversation on, you know, why they like your products and what they may dislike about your products. Cause that's a good way to always improve. Right. And I think if you're not listening to your customers you and not improving on those things that, you know, every day, day in, day out users use it for, um, and there's ways to make it better, you know, that you're missing out. So, I mean, you know, and I know that goes for pretty much every company that was in that building that day or that week, you know, is, uh, you know, everybody's always looking for that feedback and stuff like that. So, um, you know, and then, you know, some of those guys are looking to partner up with like a sponsorship or a product deal or something like that, too. And it's a good time to, uh, you know, start off a relationship and then follow it up after the show because, you know, it's, I'm not going to say like deals aren't made right at the show, but you know, you got to remember those companies there to work for those retailers, potential retail customers that are there. Right. So sometimes it's not the best time in the world to like take up a guy's time for an hour in a booth, telling him how you're like the bee's knees and he should sponsor you. Right. <laughs> but that's a good time to say, Hey, it was good to meet you. Um, do you have a business card? Can we follow up on this after the show or whatever? And, you know, nine times out of 10, they'll respect you a lot more for doing that. So, but yeah, for sure. Definitely a networking experience. Um, I actually, this was the first year I went to the line cutters party. Line cutters throws a big party every year and I usually never go. And this year we went and, uh, you know, ran into some familiar faces in the industry and got to chat and, you know, catch up and, uh, you know, make some new friendships and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, so you got those, that social aspect, right? That's when a lot of like networking and stuff happens is when it's outside of the show, when you're not uber focused on, you know, sales or things like that, um, for whatever company you're there for. Right. Sure. <clears throat> Very interesting. Um, yeah, I know I've definitely uh, had an interest to go. Um, just, you know, timing and all that other stuff. But uh, definitely hoping that um, I can try to sort of make it <laughs> next year in a sense. Um, also got some go other goals I want to try to accomplish before then as well. Um, nice. But, uh, yeah, <clears throat> we'll, uh, we'll definitely have to see about that. But um, it, It's any... funny because you could always tell who's first time I cast because, like, <laughs> the whole time they're, like, going like this. Their head's <laughs> on a swivel because you see all these, like, people walking by, like I was talking about earlier, and you're just doing this the whole time, and you're like, holy cow, holy cow, holy cow. Um, <laughs> we're, so my first I cast, I remember I saw um, uh, Tim Little from oh. – uh, Tactical, Tactical Bassin. Bassin, right? Oh. And I and I saw Matt Allen too, but I got a a, a photo with Tim Little in the oh. front lobby. Jealous. And this year, this year, this is a funny story. I I haven't, I don't think I've shared this anywhere yet. But uh, uh, there was a few of us. We were just coming out of dinner from this little burger place right by uh, where we were staying. And here comes Matt Allen and Tim Little just walking down the sidewalk talking, you know, and uh, they they come, you know, they're going to walk right past us. So, you know, everybody's like, oh, my God, it's Tactical Bass. And I'm just like, what's up, guys? Like, hey, guys, how's it going tonight? And we're like, good. And I'm like, hey, I'm sure you guys get this a lot, but I just wanted you to know I just took out my third mortgage on my home. 
<laughs> to pay for all the tackle you suggest I buy. And, <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, we got a laugh out of it. That was a total joke. I don't have three mortgages, but you know, they got a kick out of it and it was like, all right, man, you know, have a, have a good evening, you know, enjoy the rest of the show guys. And you know, that's that, right. They're normal people. Right. But we always envy guys and gals like that and kind of put them up on a pedestal. So when you see them, you're like, oh, 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 oh. you know, first eye cast. Cause that's how it was the first time I saw Tim little. And, uh, you know, this time it's just like casual, like one of your buddies you're messing with. Right. So it's kind of wild, but. Right. Oh man. Yeah. I could totally see myself doing that, you know, first time there I <laughs> see people and I'm just like, hi. And then <laughs> yeah. like, doing that like deer in the headlight stare at him like sure i don't know sure. what to say <laughs> yeah yeah I, that's i mean and that's true too like i was at the classic this year i was at red crest and you know you get a lot of big names like that and that's an actual consumer show so you know they get bombarded with people oh can i get your autograph can i get a photo blah 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 blah. and they know that and they're ready for it but you know the industry show they can kind of chill out and be themselves because they're not in that public spotlight right so sure. it's kind of kind of interesting and cool at the same time to get them you know in a relaxed state versus high tension you know public spotlight mm -hmm. you know so right yeah definitely now <clears throat> comparatively you know you were talking about you know being at the classic and then compared to kayak or the icast i mean mm -hmm. i know it's two completely different things but um you know what would um like a company or whatnot do with the classic because i mean i know the classic is just more than just you know the, the fishing tournament aspect <clears throat> of things yeah like yeah, Classic and Red Crest are, um, they have a big expo, you know, that goes along with the tournament, right? So, you know, you'll have all those pretty much same companies that are at ICAST, minus the saltwater companies, obviously, um, show up to the Classic and the Red Crest Expo, and they're selling you products there. Whereas yeah. ICAST, they're just displaying products. They're not selling anything. Granted, you know, you go through the show about two hours before close on Friday, you could probably score a big deal, you know, through one of those vendors because it's less product to pack up. Right. But, um, you know, that's, that's the biggest difference, but I mean, they're, they're similar. They're like the classic, the classic over red crest, I would say, um, classic was definitely like the eye cast of the public. You know what I mean? It's, uh, mm -hmm anybody and everybody's there ton of people displaying and selling products and things like that and not only that but we've been discussing it within the industry i guess and i think i've talked about it on some podcasts before like the classic has kind of become like the new iCast, right you're getting a lot of companies that are releasing stuff at the classic this year I think there's a few reasons for that and i don't want to go deep into the politics on that whole aspect but um you know the potential of it actually hurting icast um which in return hurts the industry right but um you know at the same respect like yeah we talk about the icast right now and you know just some average person off the street can't just you know get a ticket and walk in or you know get a badge and walk in actually there was some guy out front the one day i snuck out for a break and uh the guy's with a transportation company and he made five meetings with five different companies at the show and didn't realize he needed a badge to get in so he was trying to buy somebody's badge to get in the show to have these business meetings oh. to set up logistics for these companies He's oh. like, yeah, I thought it was just your regular average fishing show. And we're like, no, dude, like oh, no yeah. public is allowed to just walk into the show. And like, they're super strict about that. Like there's, so when you walk in, um, you can walk into the main lobby, but once you try to go down the escalator onto the show floor, there's security up there. And then once you get to the bottom of the stairs, there's doors you walk through, there's security there. And if you don't have a badge, you're getting held up or kicked out you know like oh, told like you gotta leave or go get a badge reprinted up 
up front and i think that costs you like 15 bucks you know but Jeez. um yeah it's uh it's one of those deals right it's super super strict on you know just letting the general public get in there but on the flip side you know if if i was an average angler and i wanted to go to probably the biggest bass fishing show of the year i would definitely say it's a classic for sure yeah and this past year was in knoxville this coming year it's in oklahoma yeah i was actually just literally looking that up because i'm like all right where's the classic at next year and it's on um grand lake tulsa oklahoma march yep. 22nd through the 24th yep yep yeah and i mean at knoxville the way that that whole facility was set up there was a building across the street from the main building that i believe had two floors the building i was working out of had like four levels i think and i mean it's just packed with vendors there's like there was little rooms off to the side packed with vendors um yeah i mean the whole place was jam-packed the downstairs was where all the big stuff was like the boats and the motors and uh old town was actually down there and um man i'm trying to think who else black rifle coffee was down there uh -huh. they had like pallets of coffee they were giving away <laughs> and i was like so like i tried to sneak down there and get uh get a little coffee action going in the morning um but yeah, I mean, anybody that's anybody in the fishing world, right, is uh, in the bass fishing world, I should say, is uh, is pretty much at that show. And it's it's pretty cool. And like I said, you know, you could buy tackle. Some of these manufacturers now are releasing some products there. So like you can get the newest and greatest there sometimes. Um, and, you know, they're usually pretty stacked up. And I was surprised there was quite a few like kayak related things um at that show and kayak manufacturers and things like that so um you know i you would could sure out. hope so i mean especially with um well you know, yeah bass being in the kayak series and i saw some of those guys too um because i remember uh i ran into uh jeff malott actually from kayak mm -hmm. bass nation and um lambert was leading day one i think it was and i know uh jeff was up there too and uh just <laughs> totally random like he came out of the bathroom and he was right there and it was like hey man what's happening and uh we were catching up and i was like how did lambert end up you know and uh he's like man he he i, I don't think he skunked day two he just didn't catch as big of a limit yeah and i was like oh man that's a bummer you know but they had a huge weather change and stuff like that and i think that's where uh who won that was it russ Oh. It was Snyder's, wasn't it? Was it Russ? I think it yeah. was. Yeah, it was yeah. Russ. And That's Drew, right. what yeah. Drew Gregory wasn't too far behind. Yeah. And, um, but you know, you saw guys like that walking around there. Fluke Master was there. Chad Hoover. Um, uh, I think I saw Casey Reed walking around there. Nice. Um, I'm trying to think of who else. Like a lot of the big tournament guys that fish the Bass Series were all walking around because their tournament was over. I think like wednesday or thursday mm -hmm. um so um they're there walking the expo working for some sponsors and things like that so but uh yeah that's definitely a, a must must see like this year was my first year at the classic and uh it was crazy like i didn't even get to walk around that much just because i was working but uh man they do a kickoff party um the night before which is super cool it's right there at the expo so you get all set up that day and then um you know the public's uh invited down they got food they had food trucks and like beer carts and things like that they had uh fireworks and one of those drone shows have you ever seen a drone show i haven't i've Dude, heard of them though i got some reels on my uh instagram go check those out like it was wild. Like I had never seen that. It was one of the, one of the most impressive things I've ever seen, for sure. <laughs> nice. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, I was just looking at uh, the standings from the Bassmaster Classic this year, and yeah, you were right. Yeah, Lambert had a 
really strong lead on day one was 98 and a quarter, but then mm -hmm. yeah, day two just just couldn't keep uh, couldn't keep them thin. So um, yeah, that was uh, Russ Snyder's. Yeah, as we uh, like to call him, the Triple Crown. Has has anybody done Triple Crown yet? Has he done? Has he won the Hobie I TOC? I don't think he's done a Hobie. I could be wrong think. though. Yeah. I know he's done KBF. I know he's yep. done uh, Bassmaster, and I think he's, I think he's the only one really in contention for doing that Triple Crown. Uh huh. Yeah, that'll be interesting. But we should uh, we should come up with an award for that. Yeah. Triple the Triple Crown. Crown. You get uh, three shots of Crown Royal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, shoot. It's either that or like Crown Royal, Seagram 7, and what's another crown type uh, liqueur? Uh, um, hmm. I'll think. Oh, you froze. Oh, no. Oh, Can you're you back. Me? Yeah. All right. Cool. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I don't know. He, he's got that in the bag if he wants it, for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it'll be really interesting to see how it all shakes out. Sure. Right on. Well, yeah, definitely uh, good stuff uh, about Classic and ICAST. Um, you know, and of course, uh, all the exciting stuff that uh, Dubro has coming out as well. Um, kind of wanted to ask, you know, kind of maybe your thoughts. I mean, you're I guess what we'd still call relatively new to the ICAST uh, scene in a sense, but um, I don't know how much time you've got to look at some of the new, uh, you know, products and stuff like that. But um, I'd heard that at least I, I kind of got the impression and I didn't get a big chance to really look through a lot of like, you know, the award winning uh, baits and other stuff like that. But I don't know, like I kind of just got the feeling that it was just kind of like, you know, there wasn't really any quote unquote like game changers or anything that really stood out to people that was like, oh yeah, that's like a totally new innovative design type thing. Just, uh, you know, curious on your thoughts being there the last couple of years, if that's just kind of how the show is or just, you know... Is it, yeah. is it a world of, you know, companies just playing copycat in a sense, you know? Yeah, I don't, it's, uh, you know, I kind of, kind of get where you're going there, but, uh, <laughs> um, you know, it's, uh, I, man, I, I really didn't get to walk around much. The walking around that I did was more to, uh, go work on some business deals, um, but, however, obviously, you know me, I'm a freaking nerd and I got to catch up on everything that was there. Plus, not only that, but, you know, the Paddle and Finn guys were there, like, um, broadcasting out of the Dubro booth. So, I was getting bits and pieces from those guys who were actually walking around and, and looking at stuff. Um, <clears throat> on the kayak side of things... Um, the i mean old town made a splash with that whole assisted pedal drive or whatever mm -hmm. um i get it um i think the price points is what's going to kill them however um you know i'm good friends with one of the reps for old town and i was chatting with him and um you know i was like the nice thing is is with this setup you got everything you need you don't have to go out and source a battery. You don't have to go out and source this or that. You know, it's plug and play, right? right. So yep. I think I think that's where they win on that. Um, on the native Titan X, um, you know, I'm a new canoe guy. That's pretty obvious. And everybody's like, oh, it's a new canoe, right? Yeah, I get what you're talking about, like 360 swivel seat, this and that. However... You got to understand that, you know, uh, Big Adventures gained a very knowledgeable person for R&D, which uh, was a new canoe guy for many years, uh, Romel, the wizard from the West Coast. And, 
you know, he left New Canoe and had an opportunity to go work R and D for Big Adventures. So when I look at that boat, I look at it as a very good friend of mine helped design a pretty cool boat, right? Like I'm not jaded. I I really don't care what anybody floats out of. Um, but I thought there was some really cool concepts incorporated in that boat with like the recessed battery box back behind the seat. Yes. Old town has something similar, um, you know, things like that. Um, they changed the hatch around, they put in some wiring ports, things like that. Um, which yeah, those are incorporated on the unlimited, but you know, at the same time, man, it's okay. Somebody may have done it first, but it doesn't mean somebody else can't do it better. Right. And I'm not, necessarily saying that like i haven't got a chance to like physically touch and feel the actual boat right but you know there's always rooms for improvements on you know many things across the board um and then uh bonafide had this skiff um which it looks like the rvr and they just chopped the gunnels off of it okay i get it nice thrown go boat a lot of people are, you know, fishing off of paddle boards and things like that. So they're kind of, you know, tackling that side of the market was was my opinion on that, um, which was, you know, why not explore a different area of that market, so to speak, right? right. Um, uh, who, who released the big swim bait, the plastic swim bait? Was it Berkeley? Oh, um, yes, I'm pretty sure that was Berkeley. So I heard a lot of controversy about that, too. Like, mm -hmm. oh, it looks like the Zaldane one, or maybe it was the Mega Bass one, or Mega I don't Bass even know. Mega Bass or something like that, I, yeah. yeah. I'm not a big swim bait guy, right? Um, but, uh, you know, I get it, like, whatever. But, you know, to have... Berkeley, one of the biggest manufacturers jumping into that side of the market, I think it's cool because it adds competition. It adds an addition to that. Like, I'm not going to fault them. However, I heard like the first round they had to like recall back or something. And don't quote me on any of this. This is all hearsay. But, um, you know, supposedly they got whatever the problem was corrected. And um, now they're they're shipping them and uh, you can get them in stores and things like that. I know I've seen people post like, oh, so-and-so's got these now or Tackle Warehouse or whoever it may be. Um, i trying to think what else uh, that I heard or saw that uh, was pretty cool. Oh, uh, Suspense came out with a kayak cart. Um, I, I wasn't able to look at it super close, but mm -hmm. I heard that was super cool. Um um, was it Yakutek that came out with a new measuring board? That well, that was 3D printed, oh. and it was labeled Do Not Touch, along with the other things that they released. So, <laughs> you know, that's something too, right? Like, you see a lot of companies bring prototypes like that to the show, and I think they're trying to gauge reaction on whether mm -hmm. or not they should invest in the, that idea, right? And who knows? Sure. Um, but yeah, they released uh, that board at iCast. I didn't get to look at it close. I saw some pictures when we were on the way down. Um, I don't know. I mean, you know, it's like everybody says, well, it's not accepted in most tournaments right now. Well, however, right. Yeah, this is brand new. <laughs> however, you know. Obviously, Yak Attack's got some influence on the whole kayak fishing industry. Like, every tournament trail sponsored by Yak Attack. So, hey, you know. And, you know, they're trying to grab a piece of that catch pie, which, okay, I get it. But I think you're fighting fire with fire there. But, <laughs> I know. Um, treading that, some dangerous waters there. <laughs> but that's that's a whole different story, right? But. You know, at the same time, like I said, like that brings in, you know, competition to the industry and uh, it makes everybody elevate their game a little bit more. Right. Is is my opinion. Uh, I mean, we released a new product that conflicts with Yak Attack, right, with our new Twister Track knobs. But 
you know, hey, we're not trying to make Yak Attack go away. I mean, they make plenty of accessories and stuff, and they've been successful and whatever. And we'll continue making some stuff at Dubro Fishing, but there's plenty of space for everybody. You know what I mean? And, you know, that's the thing, right? Like, having that competition, like you saw that when Yak Gadget popped up. You know, uh, who is it? Yak Gear has kind of stepped up with some new products, mm-hmm. um, things like that. You know, it's, uh, you know, like forever there was Torquedo. Now you got Newport making mm-hmm. a similar mm-hmm. motor, right? And that's, you know, cause it's, these it's guys. the nature, yes, the yeah. nature of the processes. I mean, you look, you know, 10, 15 years back, you know, I mean, yeah. look everybody at, was. Yeah. <laughs> everybody was in a wilderness system. Now right. it's like, you know, everybody's like, ew, wilderness systems, but they <laughs> actually make a cool boat. Like that recon's a nice boat. Like I was looking at it. Was it at the show or was it at a shop? I forget where it was. Um, but you know, it's it's actually a pretty cool little boat, you know? Like I'm not a huge fan of their pedal drive, but like, you know, I don't fault anybody for being in it. And the guy we were just talking about that's about to win the triple crown he's in a wilderness systems like you know like you can't fault anybody for being in a boat but i think it's cool you know seeing all the the edge and stuff there um i think the one thing that was disappointing this year compared to years past of me going to icast was the lack of kayak manufacturers being at the show Hobie wasn't there. New Canoe wasn't there. Jackson wasn't there. Um, Who was there? Uh, Bonafide Native was there. Old Town. Vibe. And I think that was it. it. Bonafide Native. Yeah, I definitely noticed the the lack of presence. uh, Boat. B-O-T-E. They make a lot of stand-up paddle boards and stuff like that. But... um, yeah, I mean, other than that, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's kind of a bummer. Um, I think some of the industry is scared right now um, because COVID's over. They had this huge rush and a lot of dealers went, oh, my God, what's this year going to be like? Oh, my God, we shouldn't do anything and we shouldn't order massive amounts of inventory. But, right. um you know, I know there are some shops across the country that are down this year um, compared to last year, which rightfully so. But a lot of the ones that I've talked to, they're up compared to 2019 pre-COVID. So, you know, you had a, a big scare in the industry. And, you know, again, um, you know, it's one of those things. Do we go to the classic or do we go to the ICAST? You know, I think that's where you're going to see some of those pop up in spring um, just because the cost difference is tremendous. But, you know, um, it is what it is. I mean, I'm not in charge of those companies. So, you know, <laughs> right. who cares what I say? Right. But. Right. Yeah. I mean, another thing that I've definitely noticed, too, um, in the industry, just this year alone, um is uh, just kind of like the the change ups in the way a lot of companies have their, um, I guess, you know, pro teams or whatever mm-hmm. you might want to call them. Um, because, um, and I, I'm sure that, you know, a lot of the word has gotten out, you know, about Hobie, you know, kind of, you know, changing a lot of different stuff. Um, I haven't gotten an official word about you know my status with the Hobie fishing team i mean sometimes no news is good news but then sometimes no news at all in any way shape or form isn't really good either so um i'm trying to hang on to every little bit i can because uh i mean a lot of people who know me like Hobie is like that that's been my brand ever since i got started um sure Sure, sure, sure. You know, I mean, it's it's going to be really, really hard to just, you know, if it does kind of go down and they just don't have, you know, the pro teams and other stuff like that anymore. It's just, it's, oh, it's heartbreaking. You know, I mean, you you see the years of, of companies, you know, doing the things that they have, 
and whatnot, you know, and then to see it just change so abruptly, you're just like, holy cow, like, and I'm sure, you know, there's a million different factors, you know, yeah. behind a lot of these decisions, you know, I respect that too. I just, I don't want it to go away. <laughs> you know? yeah. I mean, Hobie, Hobie's gone through quite a few changes in the past couple of years, right? Yes. Um, yep. And things like that. And yeah, I mean, you know, it's, I don't blame those companies, right? Like they're, they're playing it cautious, especially with the world, the way it is right now and the economy and, you know, Inflation. You, you're coming up to an election and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and nobody knows what's going to happen. Right. Um, yeah. So, I, I mean, I get it. I get it. But um, I think overall the industry as a whole is still, grooving you know what i mean like yeah you, you you had a little downtick after the covid stuff um backed off but they're still cranking out and i oh, man where was i reading that article um i was reading an article on the industry and they they were still up like four percent or something like that five percent wasn't huge right but sure. still you in know, positive <laughs> yeah exactly and i think um you know you know, with the whole COVID thing, it got a lot of people back into the outdoors and they stuck with it. Right. Cause that was the big question. Well, you know, when everything goes back to normal, these people are just going to stop fishing or, you know, camping or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. outdoor recreational activity they did. And um, yeah, you saw a slight downtick, but it wasn't, wasn't huge. Right. So right. Um, yeah, it'll be interesting. I mean, especially going into next year and stuff like that, but um I, I'm I wouldn't be too scared. And, you know, I'm sure you're gonna see see some new things coming out in the kayak realm next year for sure. Um all across the board from boats to accessories to, you know, the little things, right? So uh -huh. um, you know, everybody's continuing to evolve. I just hope somebody like figures out a way to make live scope a lot cheaper. Oh my gosh, I know. <laughs> but, Good riddance. And like I, I, I wish it could be like integrated in with everything else as well. Like the transducer wasn't like this awkward divide. Well on a kayak at least. So let me let me ask you this because I've had I've had a few conversations and some of them took place at ICAST, so I guess it's fitting around live and everybody's like, yeah, live scope. And, I'm like nope. and honestly i don't i see it jokingly like if it was like somewhat relatively decently priced i might buy it however i look at it as a hindrance versus a help and and i say that loosely because i know it could be a big help um respectfully but I see so many guys on boats and kayaks and all they're doing is this. They're looking straight down at the grass. Uh, near. And, you know, if those fish are eating, it's great. But nine times out of 10, you see a bunch of guys fishing a bunch of fish that don't want to eat and they get hung up on them, which is beneficial to you because now you're going out finding those hungry fish. Right. And, and getting bit whereas those guys are just f hung up and folk have no interest you know right yeah and and yeah. two like just because you see a fish on the fish finder doesn't mean he's gonna bite the bait you're throwing or whatever else right. so may not even be a bass <laughs> yeah right it could be you know i've seen some of the graphics you can pretty much make out a bass but Sometimes big crappies look like bass. Sometimes catfish look like bass, whatever. But yeah, I don't know, man. I just kind of laugh at it all, you know, and it, it's not even fishing at that point. Right. In summer, especially if you're a tournament angler, which I pretty much semi-retired from tournaments. So, you know, it's like, I'm not super concerned about it, but. I mean, I know how to read side scan really good and, and down scan, right? So, like, I feel like I have an edge there. But, um, me you know, that that whole live scope thing, man, I just, I kind of I kind of laugh because 
I've seen so many guys dump like thousands upon thousands of dollars into running two, three graphs. And I'm like, oh is that really necessary? Does it make you that much better of a fisherman? Right. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah, you got to have it, you know, like, yeah, you know, pros and cons of life scope, you know, I mean, um, buddy of mine, you know, him to uh, Cody Winger. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, you know, I'll kind of talk with him a little bit after tournaments that we fish together and, you know, and I'll hear him kind of mention stuff about, yeah, the side scope was, you know, really beneficial today or just like, yeah, no, live scope wouldn't even be turned on in this lake or something like that, you know. It's just, it's always interesting to hear, you know, all the, the different and mixed feedback about it. I mean, every electronic <clears throat> uh, fish finder has its time and its place. You know, I mean, you got a deep, clear lake. Yeah, I mean, you're going to be running side scan and down scan and everything. Maybe even your, um, uh, oh my gosh, I'm totally blanking on the name of it now. Your life scope <laughs> yeah, yeah. or whatever, you know. But like you go to a place like here at Banner Marsh where it's nothing but weeds. It doesn't matter what, you know, two grand... Right electronic device yeah. you have you might be able to read it when you're in like a, a deep little pocket but then like once you get in those weeds man you, you don't see shit so <laughs> i i did forget to mention this and since we're on live scope it it's fitting but uh uh yak gadget we're actually gonna me and jay are gonna have him on later this week um he came out with a live scope mount that's super cool super unique and affordable um it's got like the handle like the sniper marine one does but you can adjust it up and down and it's just a little twist knob that locks it in place and then um in the same aspect where you know his paddle clip holders clip in and out mm -hmm. he did the same thing for that so if you hit your transducer uh -huh. mount on a log it kicks up and i haven't seen that but Again, uh, it may be something out there. I am haven't dove into that whole world. Right, um, yeah. Lot, you know, but John was showing it at his booth, and I actually shot a little video over there, and uh, I was looking at it after we were uh, finished up filming, and uh, I was like, this is actually sweet, man. Like, he, he definitely thought that out. And I forget, like, the price point on it, I think is, like, I want to say he said a hundred bucks or somewhere around there. Don't quote me on that, but right. I mean those sniper marine ones are like what four fifty five hundred. Really? See, I haven't even looked into like yeah. all the accessories because I'm just like, a, I'm not even going to bother getting it right now because right. b, I still don't even know half of the options on my current fish finder as it is, and and c, it's just yeah, it's it's a lot more stuff to have on there and a lot more. Um, Oh, just like, just coordination on my kayak, I got to figure out. Because I know a lot of people like having the screens like in front of their feet or yeah. whatever on the Hobies. Yeah. But for me, I'm just like, listen, I'm I'm short and fat. Trying to lean forward over my pedals, like that's not going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> I got to have it off to the side. But, um, you know, I, I've seen a pe couple of people have like mounts and stuff where they will pull up their transducer or whatever and just like clip it on or something like that or just you know put it in the back of the kayak and i'm just like okay well yep. do they not have some sort of device to just like you know kick it up and lock it in place and from what yeah. you're talking about that sounds like what that's gonna do so. yeah john john put that out and then uh what else did he put out he put out uh um like kind of like a front bow mount for running an anchor down oh interesting for wheel oh did i cut out there you did a little bit yep you're kind of like kind of goes down for the anchor um and then you know wheels back up on that he he made a replacement plate that would like replace some kayaks handles and then you know kind of same aspect for an anchor coming off the front um and uh i think i think that was it yeah 
I definitely want to pick his brain about an idea. I don't even know how it'd be incorporated, but um, I've got, um, oh, whatever it's called. I know it's called a couple of different things, but either the triple thread or triple mount or whatever. It's so that I can have um, my motor and my. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. For yeah. Like a wizard, but um, uh, power pole. Right. On there. But what I really, really miss is that now covers and makes that back handle like useless to me. And so, like, when I would just want to, you know, hop and scoot over someone real quick and not bother with the trailer, I could just load the yak in the back of the truck, no problem. Sure. Now, granted, with this, kind of being in its place, I haven't really figured out, you know, a good way. Like, I mean, yeah, I can lift it from the front and everything, but that's just, that's, I, I don't know, it's all, it's all different. It's awkward. I'm mm-hmm. just like, I, I miss my back handle. Like, if somebody could make a mount that either incorporates, like, two handholds or something like that, I, I don't know how it would be possible, though, because, like, I'm looking at how, you know, everything is kind of formed on there. And I'm just like, I don't even know where you would put handles. <laughs> sure. <laughs> on sure, that type sure, sure. of thing, you know, so. Uh, it's it's the same way with my uh, XI3. Like I miss having my actual new canoe handle there versus like this plastic piece. It does have a handle in it, but, you know, it'd be nice to have that upper handle rather than having to reach underneath that plastic piece it's just not as comfortable in my opinion but um yeah i mean i totally get where you're coming from man it's we add all these crazy things and there's no perfect solution for for the the problem we're taking away by adding these other cool (laughs) things right yeah yeah no i get it i get it for sure awesome awesome oh gosh um what else we got? I don't know, man. I don't know. Good old iCast is over. I'm like just super ready to like chill out and relax, finish off the fishing season, go into hunting season, and then January 2nd, I hit the road again. So I don't want to talk about those seasons just yet. I mean, <laughs> it, it's. We're almost in August, and I'm yeah. just like, what the hell happened to this year? Like, yeah. it has been a really weird year this year, uh, and especially, like, weather-wise, at least here in the Midwest. For sure, um, for sure. Like, we're having our first hot week, like, all year. I mean, usually we would have had, you know, some heat indexes and stuff like that, you know, maybe June or whatnot, but it's been pretty nice but i mean this week summer has definitely been like hey guys i'm still here yeah (laughs) yeah Yeah. i i mean we had a couple days in june where i think it hit like 90s up here right but Mm -hmm. um yeah it's uh it's been relatively mild and it stayed cold for so long this year too yeah Yeah. i'm just curious like it's gonna be prolonged this year and then you know, winter again and all that crap, but hopefully not. I don't know. Right. I'm just, I'm just hoping that we can start having some either wet winters or wet springs again, because man, the drought this year. Yeah. Is like, holy cow. That was, I mean, everybody was talking about like, man, yeah, if we don't get rain in the next couple of weeks, there won't be crops to harvest. It just, it was it was it was crazy. It got a, it got a little interesting there for a few weeks, um, you know. And now that I'm working in the uh, insurance field, in a sense, um, we do have reps who do crop insurance and stuff like that. You know, it was really interesting hearing a lot of different conversations, um, you know, about you know crops and what they're gonna do. You know, what happens if we don't get rain? You know, all the all this other stuff stuff but uh, luckily we had you know finally got rain and it turned things around but you know going out to you know banner or any other place i mean it's been a consistent um you know quote unquote like drought in a sense but you can definitely tell that we are way below normal of yeah what we have been in years past i mean the last four years i've been at banner like it's always a foot lower than what it 
typically has been since I started fishing out there. And so it actually makes me wonder, because I'm going to try keeping track of this. So my last guest um, was um, John Odenkirk. Uh, yeah. The, uh, while he was a really cool dude and had some really interesting insight and was saying, you know, well, there's usually like anywhere from like, what did he say, like seven year cycles or whatnot. And so, um, you know, after you're getting towards the end of that cycle, then things will kind of start to change again. And so like, I remember, you know, um, gosh, when Adam and I were still dating, <laughs> now we're married, <laughs> 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 you know, um, why is it saying that my battery is low? How long have you guys been married now? Uh, we will be coming up, um, Five years in oh, September. Snap. That's wow. Yeah, we just had our 10 year dating anniversary. Anyway, uh, squirrel. Um, <laughs> yeah, when we were first dating, like every spring, we would have, you know, flooding, flooding. The Illinois yeah. River, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. always flooding, flooding, yeah. flooding, flooding. And now, nothing. Like, yeah. it's hardly anything. It's like we yeah. barely get enough just to keep everything growing. I mean, our yard was dead for probably all of June. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mowed the lawn today and like the backyard where it gets shady and it, you know, the moisture doesn't evaporate off right away, you know, like that's pretty green and stuff like that. But my front yard is like pretty wide open and mm -hmm. grass is still brown up there. Right. And, you know, to, to your point as well like my home lake is I, last weekend i was out it was like a foot and a half down you know yeah. and uh yeah. i know the kit uh kishwaukee river is pretty shallow right now so it's just oh, like huh? man like yeah hopefully we continue to get some storms i mean the crops are doing pretty good up here though overall mm -hmm. they've had enough like um uh, yesterday driving home from work, I was on the phone with, uh, Thomas from Tightline and, uh, you could see a, uh, the guy had a measuring stick in the corn and his field was measuring like seven and a half foot. Wow. So, huh. um, yeah. So, I mean, our corn's pretty tall up here. So we beans yeah. are doing pretty decent. Like they're green and lively and they're probably they're short. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, some fields are short, but some fields they're almost waist high on me. They so, took off. you know, yeah. yeah. So, but I don't know. I, we still got time, right? We still got what mm -hmm. two and a half months till harvest season. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's it'll definitely be an interesting harvest season for sure. But uh, kind of segueing back a little bit about uh, you know the cycles and whatnot. Um, you know, the good thing about having, you know, droughts in, well, I don't know if there's really a good thing about a drought, but, um, you know, the Mackinac River, um, the smallmouth populations weren't really the best because of the, you know, constant flooding of springs into mm -hmm. early summer, you know, and they just, they couldn't, they couldn't spawn. I mean, or sure. if they did, it just get, you know, wiped away. Whereas now in the past, probably four or five years, they've been able to spawn like normal. And so, you know, it'll be really interesting to see, um, you know, the continued improvement of fishing reports, um, you know, just on, you know, kind of that, uh, the Mackinac River just in general, you know, because I mean, it's, it's not necessarily like a known river per se, like, you know, the fox or something like that. But I mean, like there, there could be some good smallmouth in there and, you know, hopefully, uh, I can, you know, get myself to go down there sometime <laughs> stubborn to go somewhere else besides Banner Marsh. But, um, I'm telling you, Mille Lacs, man, I'm going back oh, up this, this man. next year. The fish oh. up there, just like fat, long pork chops. <laughs> right oh my god yeah that was a blast you, you had your pb up there didn't you uh well weight wise because uh you know i was up there with my my folks and uh wife so we were in the boat and uh what was that smallmouth it was like five and a half pounds or yeah. something yeah. um didn't have a bump stick in the boat um 
so I didn't put it on the measuring board. But I mean, my biggest smallie before that was 20 and three quarter, but that was on Table Rock Lake in like September. So, oh, wow. you know, it wasn't like that fall bite where they were fattening up. It was just mm-hmm. a big skinny fish. healthy but if i had a guess it was probably like four and a half pounds but um i mean we caught multiple fish over five pounds up there um just like just just tanks man um but you know you want to talk about big smallmouth my boss was up there this year and he goes every year st lawrence river up in new york Oh. And there was just a tournament up there. I forget who it was. Yes, it was, um, was it MLF or who was it? They had they multiple were... seven-pound fish caught. Yes. They had monster smallmouth up there. Oh, well, the the boss's son caught a six-and-a-half oh, um, when they were up there. Oh. Um, it was a few weeks before I cast. And, uh, yeah, that thing just looked stupid oh. i mean it looked like somebody literally stuffed a basketball in it. like <laughs> yeah. it was just bloated you know but oh my yeah. God. yeah so i gotta get up there sooner or later right yeah and of course you know lake st Clair too because uh bass I fish- has actually been on there the last few yeah. days and i've just been sitting there watching like <laughs> well i fished that with trash panda um this year that was my first time fishing st Clair. And uh, you went there. yeah, I caught, was it a 20 and a quarter or something? Oh. Um, cause we were fishing out of the kayaks, man. And we slammed it. And then my boss was up there the week after and they slammed it in the same spots. Uh, we did. And, uh, they caught, uh, multiple, like four and a half pound oh. fish. So yeah, I mean, oh. St. Clair, man, that's crazy. Yeah, We were bed fishing when we were up there, but, uh, yeah, I was. They were choking it, man. Choking oh, it. I gotta get back up there again because, like, I keep looking at my smallmouth mouth all the time. You know, it's above my head. I need. I keep meaning to like move it behind me so that way, like, yeah. you know, people can see it like on the wall behind me when I record. But like, you know, I'm sure. Just, like, <laughs> <laughs> nice. Oh nice. shoot! <clears throat> well, we are. Uh, just over that hour mark, uh, definitely been some uh, good talks, good conversation. Um, got anything else for us? No, nah, that's it. Uh, just appreciate everybody uh, listening and um, go check out Dude Bro Fishing. Appreciate everybody that's uh, supported me on that as well. So uh, just huge thanks to that. And uh, yeah, uh, we'll have Yak Edge it up getting with Chai about some of his new products and uh things like that um he's uh i know john's been working super hard at like uh dressing up his packaging doing some new products um innovating and and making some new products better so it's 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 cool to see that and it's always awesome to see the evolution of uh you know what he's doing so uh tune in for that thursday night or catch it on the podcast friday morning sweet awesome awesome definitely some good stuff to look forward to for show for show all right guys well thanks again for joining us this has been another episode of bass fishing for noobs where we bring you the techniques tricks and tips to help you rip more lips Catch you on the flip side.